We started our map reading course by looking at the keys and relating them to the local maps. Then we looked at bearings, how and why we use them. Now is the time to look at the third major part of a topographical map, the shape of the land. A contour is a line that joins places of equal height above sea level. We use contours to show the shape of the land. Where contours are close together, the slope is steep. Where the contours are far apart, the slope is gentle. This slope varies. If we have an island and the sea level was to drop by 100 metres, we'd get a new beach. If this happened again, we'd get a second beach, and so on and so forth, until we got the pattern that we can see in front of us. These beaches would represent contours. To show the shape that contours represent, we draw a cross-section, as is shown here. We have the red line cutting through the contours, the black lines dropping down to a similar height on a grid, the meeting points joined up to show us the shape of the land. Remember, of course, that on British Ordnance Survey maps, the contours are marked every 10 metres. Any change in the shape of the ground less than 10 metres will not be shown by contours. There are a number of fairly typical contour patterns, starting with the V-shaped valley, which was formed by rivers, the U-shaped valley, which was formed by glaciers, a hill, a flat-topped hill or plateau, a col, saddle or mountain pass, Spurs of higher ground jutting out onto areas of lower ground. The space between the spurs are called re-entrance. Now you've seen these basic contour patterns, it's time to go to your local map and relate the contour patterns you see on the map with the shape of the land you know in your local area. If you know the speed you're travelling at, you can work out how long it will take to cover a set distance. This makes estimating times of arrival easy. Naismith's rule is a good way of calculating your speed of travel across the ground. Basically, you take 15 minutes to walk one kilometre, and then you add a minute for every contour line you cross, going up or down. This is a good starting point but you need to find out your own speed. Once you've done that, it makes calculating your time of arrival very, very easy. Another great skill is knowing how many paces you take to cover 100 metres. This allows you to calculate distance travelled over the ground. One way to do this is to find a set distance of 100 metres and walk it counting your double pace a number of times. My double pace for 100 metres is 62, but this is on flat ground with no kit. The slope of the ground and the amount of kit you're carrying will change the number of paces you take. Using ranger beads to record your progress is a simple and effective idea. Ranger beads are divided into 100 meter beads and kilometer beads. At the end of every 100 meters you move a bead. When you've moved 9 beads, the next bead you move is a kilometer bead. Counting off the 100 metres and the kilometres will allow you to accurately and easily 
calculate the distance travelled. Now going on a little expedition to use all the techniques I've showed in the three videos. So to begin with, I set my compass to north and then applied grid magnetic angle. Then I orientated the map and established my position using three points of reference. The T-junction, the house at the side of the cemetery and the allotments. This gives me definite, accurate fix of my start position. I intend to move along a track from my start position. As a handrail, all I've got to do is remember to keep the allotments on my right hand side. I need to go east. I've set my compass to east, I've got it facing in front of me and I'm going to revolve until the red is in the shed. When that happens, I will be pointing east. I'm pointing in the right direction. That is my direction of travel, taken from the map and the compass. The pass is approximately 400 meters long. I can use my pacing to determine more or less where the path should end. To stop me overshooting or undershooting the path, I'll pace it as I go along. It's approximately 400 meters or 248 paces. Once I've got to 248 paces, then I will start to look round for a next landmark. The path is not exactly straight, but the variation from the straight line is so small it doesn't really show on the map. However, if I keep checking the general direction of my compass, I know I'll stay on track, especially as on my right hand side I've got the allotments. I've paced 400 metres and I've reached my mid destination. I've set the compass and the map to north and I've identified the road that goes uphill to the north, stays flat to the south and one behind me. To make sure which road I'm going down, I've set my compass to 116 magnetic, bearing in mind the grid magnetic angle, and identified the road behind me as the one I wish to take. I have to follow the road cross the bridge and take the first turning on the left. Once again I've orientated the map using the compass and taking the grid magnetic angle into consideration. I've laid off a course of 80 degrees which equates with the path that I'm now going to follow. As long as I keep the river on my left hand side and follow a course of about 80 degrees I should come to my next waypoint which is a bridge. I'm on the correct path but having looked at the map, I've seen that I won't reach the bridge directly. The path goes towards a road. When it nears the road, it turns left. This is an advantage because I can forget about pacing and just follow the path until it hits the road. Once it hits the road, I've got a handrail. I turn left and I follow it to the bridge. I've almost reached the road bridge and as a check feature, I've found the footbridge over to my right. I'm going to go under the road and follow the path to the railway. I've set my compass at 40 degrees just in case I can't see the railway from the road. Behind me you can see the railway line. This is another handrail opportunity. All I've got to do is follow the path until I get to the railway line. Once I hit the railway line fence I turn left and follow that. We've come through the complex of bridges and underpasses. We've set the map and the compass and taken a bearing for the path. We're going to follow the path along, keeping the river on our right hand side. Then eventually we'll come to the road junction and across the road junction is the church, our final destination. We've combined all the skills we needed to complete this expedition. The skills we've used Selecting the right map, knowing how to use a compass, setting it to north, applying grid magnetic angle, orientating the map, taking bearings to determine directions, and using pacings to work out approximate distances, 
and check features along the way, our expedition has been successful. The skills we used on this little short expedition are exactly the same ones you can use on long expeditions. I hope you found this video interesting and informative.